Films like these are the ones that get me really excited and energized as someone who is a designer, an engineer, a bit of a social scientist on at least every other day. Um, and so I'm really delighted to share a room with people who are equally interested to talk across those areas. Uh, before I start, I just want to note that there is going to be one slide that includes imagery of uh, text messages that have themes of violence and rape that might be difficult for some of you to view. And I'll let you know before I get to that slide. So if you prefer to look away, uh, that'll be totally fine. Uh, and I'll let you know when I've moved on as well. So headlines like these are no, uh, nothing new to all of you. You know, maybe because communication technologies have so much power in the world and it's so clear, society has begun to acknowledge the risks that come with living in a world that is digitally connected. People are worried about disinformation. People are worried about the effect of smartphones on our minds. They're worried about the effects of these technologies on our democracies. But they're really complex problems that are part of complex systems. And how do we manage uh, these complex systems for the common good? Well, in the 19th and 20th centuries, society was faced with similarly complex questions around managing environmental resources. In 1948, this is one of my favorite sad pictures, um, the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts closed Magazine Beach, which is just a, a few hundred feet from where I used to live. It's a riverside recreation area across the Charles River from Boston. Uh, this essential community resource had basically become too toxic for humans. This wasn't a new problem in the 1940s. Uh, there was a government report in 1875 that basically said, we don't even know how to clean this up, so we're not even going to try. Um, and at the time, managing the river seemed like an unsurmountable challenge of understanding a complex system, changing the behavior of powerful actors, figuring out the right mix of regulation, design, engineering, and environmental science that could restore the health of this resource. Uh, sadly, um, in the mid-20th century, people despaired of making the Charles River livable for people. This is a problem of commons governance, whether it's a river or today's internet. Uh, here's what the political scientist and Nobel Prize winning economist, Eleanor Ostrom, uh, said about these kinds of problems. One, you have some kind of common resource uh, with high demand like water or attention that uh, has extractive institutions, fisheries or social media companies uh, that gain value from extracting as much of that resource as possible. Uh, and then you have strong incentives in that system towards depleting or harming that common resource, but not so many incentives in the other direction. And, and so what do you do in that kind of situation? Um, you have another problem as well, that it's really hard to know what level of governance you need. In the case of a river, you have city level problems, you have problems at an individual uh, home level, problems at the level of industry um, in different parts of society. And similarly, when we think about internet governance, it's hard to know what should be left to digital neighbors, what should be left to tech companies, what should laws do. It's really hard to know what the appropriate scale is. And it's especially difficult to imagine you know, large companies like Facebook creating policy systems that work for billions of people. So this is a problem of commons governance. And there are a few other challenges to work on as well uh, in what Ostrom called the struggle to govern uh, commons. The first is that the situation and the risks evolve. Technology changes, culture changes. If you're managing fisheries or rivers, um, you know, wildlife is behaving in a certain way, industry is behaving in a certain way, the public is behaving in a certain way. And we think, when we think about the media risks, that we wrestle with, whether they're hate speech or misinformation, there are various actors that are continuously evolving their practices as well. And then of course, people are very clever and they evade whatever policy systems you put in place. So what do you do in this kind of complex evolving situation? In, in her work uh, over really a lifetime, 
uh, Ostrom explored the variety of, of ways that you can uh, work on these complex governance problems and the different pieces that need to come together. And one of those pieces that she wrote about extensively over the years was the role of monitoring, particularly monitoring and governance by the communities most affected by those issues. Um, she spent a lifetime's career identifying areas where citizen involvement plays an important role to govern common resources in these commons challenges. Uh, and she pointed out in, in one of her last academic papers uh, uh, before her death several years ago uh, that you know, governance can work well in settings where, uh, among other factors, uh, things can be monitored and that information can be verified and understood at, at relatively low cost. And in the case of water, uh, this happens all the time. So this, for example, is a set of uh, citizen science tools used by volunteers of the Charles River Watershed Association in Boston, where volunteers all across the region take these kits, they dunk bottles of water into the river, uh, they then record information about that, that water is analyzed by scientists, and they use that to generate information about the safety level of the river at any moment in time. So uh, they use statistical models combined with this citizen data collection to tell you, is this part of the river toxic and unsafe to swim? Is it maybe safe for boating? Is it safe for, safe for boating and swimming alike? And really over you know, the 70 years since a Magazine Beach was closed, but over an even longer span, there have been people involved in that monitoring that's contributed to the wider policy and environmental work done by citizen groups, by governments, uh, and by industry. And thanks to that generation, multiple generations of work, the Charles River is now safe for swimming and boating. It is an exemplar of long-term environmental management, and personally, one of my favorite places to spend an evening sunset. So how do we kind of aspire to something like this for our digital lives? And what role can citizen scientists play in our media and behavioral environments online? That's kind of a motivating question that is behind much of my scientific research, uh, my work on research methods, and the nonprofit that came out of my dissertation, um, and which is uh, less than a year old now. And Civil Servant uh, organizes the public uh, for an internet where digital power is guided by evidence, where we're doing that monitoring work that Ross Ostrom wrote about, but also where that evidence-based research is done by and accountable to the public in a democratic society, not just behind the closed doors of corporate data science teams, but something that the public has a role in and a voice in. And today I want to talk about two kinds of citizen science that I've been working on in the last year. Uh, the first theme has to do with measurement and monitoring. And here's where my next slide may be something that some of you might choose to look away. Um, uh, it's going to show images of online harassment that is common to, to women uh, politicians and journalists online. I'm now going to click for the next slide. So in February 2015, games critic Anita Sarkeesian published a list of one week of harassment she received on Twitter. Now the tweets here are associated with the Gamergate movement, but they're also pretty common for prominent and visible women online. Uh, tweets that threaten violence, uh, comments that threaten rape, uh, and you know Anita had dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of these tweets arrive in her mentions in that period of time in 2015. And around the same time, I was working with an advocacy organization called Women Action in the Media to better understand not only what kinds of harassment women face, but also what do tech companies do when they receive reports of harassment. So I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what WAM did and also what our research team did. So this advocacy organization uh, received something called authorized reporter status from Twitter. That meant that they were allowed to report harassment on behalf of other people. So uh, mostly women who faced harassment would fill in a, an intake form with WAM, 
uh, who would then review their case and help them put together a case to Twitter to say, this violates your policies. Uh, could you please take action? And WIM also offered other kinds of support. So they were able to do more for people than just say, take down tweets, which was part of what they um, organized to do. And it was a kind of a one-off project. They did it for a couple of weeks' time. And here's the process that we went through. I won't go through it in, in very great detail, but the key is really that you would have someone submit a report to WAM, um, and WAM would then do some work to better understand their case, contact the person who was the, the recipient of alleged harassment, and then they would uh, take that material that they compiled, the evidence they compiled, submit it to Twitter, and then follow up through Twitter's system uh, through the process of reporting harassment. And that allowed them to do two things. First, it meant that because they were a source of intake for harassment reports, they were able to collect a data set of harassment that people were facing. And then secondly, because they were submitting those reports to the company, they were able to record what actions the company took in response. Uh, in some ways, you can think of this as a digital version of those citizen scientists who were dropping bottles into the river, although in this case, there was a social process for both collecting data and supporting people who faced uh, forms of harassment online. And that's the point at which the uh, WAM team contacted me and a group of other researchers to um, analyze the data that they collected with the consent of the people participating. And that allowed us to uh, publish a report that categorized, for example, the different kinds of harassment that people reported experiencing, from hate speech to threats of violence uh, to incitements of violence towards others, uh, as well as analyzing in which cases did the company actually take some kind of action against the alleged harasser. So WAM would evaluate the cases, uh, arrive at a judgment about the ones they thought were credible um, and had enough evidence, and then would submit them to Twitter. And then we would see, you know, here, for example, the orange and yellow uh, uh, colors are for cases where the company took action, and the gray are for cases where the company might have disagreed or felt that it was outside of their policies. And we did a variety of statistical analyses to understand where were the gaps in how Twitter handled its harassment policies. And that study, when it came out, was then something we published. Uh, it was covered widely in the press and, and was part of a larger uh, set of pressures on Twitter that you know, slowly and in kind of a piecemeal fashion over the years has uh, led them to uh, broaden their policies and uh, do at least some things to support people better who face harassment online. There's still a lot of room for improvement at Twitter, but it's an example of something where we were able to observe this phenomenon, bring data points to what was happening, and then help inform how people addressed the problem by doing measurement and monitoring. And there are other examples of this kind of work that we see online. So for example, this year, uh, Amnesty International is doing a very similar project called Troll Patrol. In this case, they monitored all of the tweets that were received by a sample of journalists and politicians. And they have this really cool project called the Decoders, where they have thousands of crowdsourced volunteers who carry out microtasks for Amnesty on a variety of different campaigns and issues. And in this particular case, uh, earlier this year, over 6,500 volunteer decoders took over 600,000 actions to analyze tweets that were received by women politicians and journalists. And I'm really interested to see the results of their analysis because they were able to look at a much wider range with uh, better sampling methods than we were in, in WAM. Um, and so I'm really excited to see what those results are. Another example of this kind of citizen science monitoring role that you don't necessarily need privileged access to a company or their data to carry out. And in fact, in ways, uh, your work might be more credible it's if it's coming from an external independent source. Now, there are other ways that you can, can organize people to monitor questions that you might have. This is a small project that I did with Amy Rickman and Megan Steiner last summer 
after Facebook published a rainbow reaction on the site, you might have recall during uh, Pride Month last year, they added this reaction. So it wasn't just loves and laughs and wows. You could respond to someone with a rainbow. But it was a bit of a unique feature in that um, they only released that feature to some people in some parts of the country. Uh, they said major markets with pride celebrations uh, and people who followed the LGBTQ page and that it wouldn't be available everywhere. Now, I can't really speculate on the reasons that Facebook's team made that decision. It could have been for safety reasons. It could have been for like, technical reasons. But also, you might have asked, and we, we thought it was reasonable to ask, if you know, in the period after the 2016 presidential election, was the company maybe interested in managing their reputation so that their support for LGBTQ people and identities would be visible in some parts of the country and not necessarily visible to other people in the country who might take a different view of that. So we were interested to see if this kind of geo-targeted feature rollout uh, had you know, political or what its geographical dimensions were. So we used Facebook's ad targeting systems to recruit people from across the United States to help us understand where this feature was available. So we, uh, for example, we uh, took uh, 25 cities in the US and we created a radius around them. And we also looked for people who the company said they thought were interested in LGBTQ issues and uh, advertised to them. But we also advertised to people who the company said weren't interested in those issues. And we basically gave them a two or three question survey and asked them, can you see this feature? Um, and what do you think about it? So, so within each city, some large cities, some small cities within each state, we asked people who were identified as, by Facebook as LGBT interested and non-LGBT people as well. And we, we included about 326 Facebook users in that study. Now, across these cities, we failed to find any statistical pattern based on political leaning, maybe because our sample size was too small. But we did find that kind of as the company set up expectations, LGBT interested Facebook users were more likely to get the pride emoji reaction than people who the company thought were distinctly not interested in LGBT issues. And you know, you can make up your own minds about whether that's a good thing for safety reasons, whether that's a suspect thing for you know, reputation managing reasons. But it's an example of, of something where we were able to um, recruit people to be those like bottle droppers, in a sense, to map out the landscape of what different features did Facebook offer to people in different parts of the country and ask that politically important question. And, and that was a study we published in The Atlantic last summer. And these kind of methods are also being used by others. So for example, uh, ProPublica's political ad collector is a great example of this, where uh, citizen scientists, if you will, install a browser plugin uh, and they grant their consent to automatically share all of the uh, Facebook, and I think they may have Google ads as well, but you want to check. Um, no, it looks like it's just Facebook. Uh, share their Facebook ads with ProPublica so they can do reporting uh, and data analysis on what kind of ads are shown to what kinds of Americans across the country. So those are examples of kind of monitoring and measurement where you have a question about just what's happening in the case of harassment or what is the company doing and you actually need multiple perspectives, multiple people standing in different parts of the internet to tell you what they're seeing in order to get a more comprehensive picture of the question. But it's also important to ask evaluation and testing questions. Because while monitoring can tell you there is a problem, it doesn't necessarily tell you what to do about it, or it doesn't necessarily tell you what impact um, your ideas for solutions or what impact uh, a new policy or product from a company might have in people's lives. And you know, we, we think about product testing all the time, and companies do product testing all the time. But thus far, um, you know, public interest independent product testing has tended to be 
uh, something we do for industries outside of the social technology and media industry. Uh, in this article, I think some of you may have read uh, with Alan Coe and Mary Moo, we argue that tech companies have an obligation to test the effect of their products on our safety and our civil liberties, but also that there is an important role for independent behavioral product testing as well. I recently spent a day at Consumer Reports, who've been doing this kind of work since the 1930s. This, this is the chamber where they uh, put your phone or your watch, and they increase the water pressure to find out how deep it can go without cracking. This, if you see, this is a robot that basically puts on a helmet and then bashes it against a hard thing in lots of different controlled ways to find out if a bicycle helmet is going to protect your head in the way you think it will. This is kind of a blast from the past. Um, one of their early testing uh, apparatuses, which is actually for testing socks. So they put socks onto this machine, and then it just vibrates. And they look to see how long the sock goes before wearing a hole in it. And so you know we've had this expectation. So Consumer Reports is a nonprofit. They do everything independently. They have secret shoppers who go out and buy products off the shelves so that the you know, products they get from companies aren't different from the ones that an average consumer might get in the store. And they're a member-supported organization, and that allows them to do this independent work. Um, but it's one thing to kind of buy a bunch of bicycle helmets. It's much harder to test something like this. You know, people have been debating for a very long time whether Facebook and other social platforms should have a thumbs down button as well as the like. Um, and you could kind of do lab testing of psychology questions, and there's a long tradition of that. But social technologies have a social context. You can't necessarily take the dislike button out of the world and create a robot that will like test the you know, dislike button in a secret lab in Yonkers, New York. It kind of has to happen out in the world in some way if you want to know what it's actually going to do. Just like in a complex system like a river, you know that it's interacting with these other forces. And you need to test your cleanup idea in that complex system. So I recently had a chance to ask this question uh, with a very large online community. Uh, they had this question, do downvote buttons cause unruly behavior online? And can hiding downvotes prevent it? So there's been this debate for years about uh, the kind of upvotes, downvotes, these up buttons, these down buttons. In one view, like when uh, someone clicks a button sharing approval or disapproval, it's a valuable signal to you of what other people think is acceptable, what psychologists call social norms. And the theory is that when you receive that um, signal, then you might be more likely to follow the norm. Uh, and at the same time, um, there's another view that if you don't feel like you really want or share norms with that community, you might experience something that psychologists call reactance, where you're like, no way, I now feel even more entrenched against this group. I'm going to behave even more badly. And there's been a scholarly conversation around this in social computing for about the 14 or 15 years. There was an early study by Cliff Lampy and Paul Resnick where they looked at the social uh, platform uh, slash dot. And they analyzed a lot of historical data. And they looked at whether volunteer raters who are upvoting and downvoting com uh, comments actually provided a reliable signal of the quality of those comments. And their answer in the, the early 2000s was kind of a qualified yes. You know, People upvoting and downvoting can kind of, on average, give a signal for how good a comment is. But that didn't necessarily, and they answered a, tried to answer a few of the behavioral questions with their correlational study, and were kind of mutedly positive. But then more recently, there was a study uh, by Justin Chang and colleagues here at Stanford 
Um, and they also analyzed a historical data set, in this case from four different political news sites in the US. And uh, they used a method called a quasi-experiment, and they concluded that authors of negatively evaluated content, after that happens, contribute more, and their future posts are of lower quality. So the concern here is that when, when you comment, you get downvoted, you kind of get frustrated, you, you realize that people don't share your values, and in political debates, that means you want to kind of come out fighting and be even nastier. Um, and so you kind of had these two big data style studies, which while they didn't exactly ask the same questions, were kind of pulling in these two different directions. Maybe they help, maybe they actually cause more problems than they solve. And that was the setting in which the moderators of the Our Politics community on Reddit came to me and the Civil Servant Project and asked, you know, what they should do about the downvote button that they had on the Reddit platform. So this is a community that currently has more than 4 million subscribers. It's one of the highest vil, uh, volume conversations about politics in America online. And after the 2016 election, they had a very unique challenge. So this is one place where liberals and conservatives do have very large conversations. And after the election, you had the situation where uh, the liberals were a, a much larger percentage of commenters. Because of that, uh, they could kind of control the content through voting. Uh, liberals were able to upvote things they liked and downvote things they didn't like because they had more of a vote share. They had a disproportionate influence. Uh, at least this was the community perception. Um, they had what the moderators considered to be a more civil style, but they also felt like they had lost and so we're more inclined to just like downvote their opponents into oblivion because they might not have won the election, but they sure could win the votes on Reddit. And the conservatives were a smaller percentage of the commenters. They couldn't control content through voting. They were associated in people's minds with greater incivility. And so like, they feel that they'd won because they'd won the election, but they certainly weren't will winning here. And this was driving a lot of conflict in the community as you might expect. And you would have situations like this. So here are two examples of comments in the community. I'm curious to hear uh, what your guesses are of which of these comments received a high positive score. So I, I, wanna, I wanna ask for a raise of hands for how many people think that the top one um, was, uh, downvoted more than the bottom one, and how many of you think the, the bottom one was downvoted more? So how many do you think the top one received more down, down votes? Raise your hand. Okay, and how many do you think uh, this one received more down votes? A lot more people think this one, and actually this is the one that received more down votes. Uh, this was actually very cogently and respectfully phrased. Uh, this is not a particularly respectful way to have a conversation with others, though it's also a pretty common way for people to talk to each other about politics online. And the interesting thing on Reddit is that while the site provides these upvote buttons and downvote buttons for every comment, the moderators had the ability to modify what's called the style sheet for their own community's pages and actually hide the downvote button from the community. And they were curious, if we do that, uh, can we reduce some of the conflict that occurs? And so in this experiment, we, we took uh, just over a month of time, and we randomly assigned some days to have all downvote buttons in the comments hidden. And other days, we would have the downvote button visible. And then we looked at um, the vote scores for those comments, we looked at also how people behaved and how commenters kind of stayed within the community rules or went over the line. But there was a catch, just like there is with any of these technical interventions. Um, you know, you might think that hiding the downvote is something clean that affects everyone. But in the case of, of Reddit, there are multiple interfaces that people experience the system with. 
you know, we're not just testing some theory about feedback that people get from others, we're testing a technical intervention. And in our politics, uh, hiding the downvotes would only affect 45% of the people, the people who uh, participate in the community from the desktop version. There are various mobile versions of the site uh, that were used by about 65% of commenters. So we knew that even if we made this fundamental design change, it wouldn't be you know, fully distributed across everyone. And it was a good reason to test whether this intervention would make the difference that we cared about. And so here are the, the findings that, that we had uh, in our pre preliminary analysis. The first, uh, in the first case, we monitored the first 10 comments that were posted to the discussion and, and checked this kind of fuzzy vote score that Reddit provides uh, over time. So looking at just the, the share of votes that the, the comment received over the first few articles. And this particular chart shows the effect of hiding down votes on the comment score of um, uh, the first 10 comments uh, over time. And we found that while hiding down votes did actually increase the vote scores on average, so this line is above zero, especially in about the first 90 minutes, um, it only really uh, affected it only slightly. In fact, kind of like Ostrom described, people uh, come up with ways to evade your governance system. And some of the, you know, especially some of the more liberal groups on this, in this community felt that uh, by hiding down votes, we were um, preventing them from using one of their most useful tools for shaping the conversation in the way they wanted to shape it. Um, and so they worked to circumvent this design change um, that we introduced. But also, there were just a lot of people on mobile who kept on getting their uh, down votes just as normal. Then when we looked at the outcomes on behavior, uh, these are the th two things that we found. When we looked at over 32,000 first-time commenters over a period of 34 days, we did find that people whose comments were eligible to receive downvotes. So on days where the downvote button was there, they were more likely to come back and comment. So kind of in line with Justin Chang's, that like when the downvote tool is available and downvotes are more common, people come back and participate more, um, just as Justin Chang discovered. But we failed to observe any effect on uh, whether those people who came back and who were first time commenters uh, behaved more badly uh, over time. And it may just have been our sample size was too small, but we weren't able to provide evidence either way to answer this deeper question about whether hiding the downvote button um, uh, you know, changes behavior, mostly because this intervention that everyone thought, in fact, the community thought either it was going to be very successful or that it was going to be incredibly disruptive. Uh, it turned out that the idea wasn't nearly as powerful as everyone assumed, which was incredibly useful finding because it allowed us to say, well, this is a really still an important question. This intervention isn't doing very much at all. And so if the community wants to find other way, like is looking for a way to manage conflict, they're going to have to look somewhere else. So that's an example of uh, a test where we're not just looking at mapping out the nature of political conflict in our politics, but people have an idea for what to do about it. And uh, we were able to support that community to ask the question. Uh, one thing that sets this research a little bit aside from your typical product testing research is that it was conducted using software and processes that were completely independent of Reddit, the company. So the um, uh, software that we used called Civil Servant, shares a name with the nonprofit, is software that a community can invite into their subreddit and soon into their language Wikipedia and supports them to coordinate uh, behavioral tests like this one uh, at scale in their communities without having to ask for permission from the company, but in a way that is done with the consent of the community that's asking the question. So going with this idea of industry independent citizen behavioral science. I want to briefly share one final example uh, because uh, one of the appeals of citizen science 
is that it broadens who can carry out scientific inquiry through technologies and procedures that are accessible to the general public. And these community-wide studies on Reddit, while they do broaden who's doing behavioral research, um, it's not quite at the point where anyone can just do their own study. And that's a question that we're continuing to explore. And here's one example of a study that I've been working on over the last year that anyone can do, or at least that's the aspiration, where there's a question about the impact of a feature that Facebook has introduced in people's individual social environments. So I'm sure if you're Facebook users that you've noticed this feature from the company, where when you type a very short message, they allow you to put some background image behind it. Like in this case, it's kind of cute. There are these little cat, pink cat bunnies um, or these trumpets. And that's very different from the traditional Facebook status update, which is just dark gray text on a white background. And I was really curious to find out, does this change anything about how people have a conversation with me about the things I post? In this case, poems that I like to share on Facebook. So does a colored background increase Facebook interactions on average? And if so, how much? Now, to, to do an experiment of this kind, there are several parts, right? I needed an intervention or a treatment, which was posting a poem with a colored background. I also needed a comparison group, or what experimenters sometimes call a control or a placebo. Here, like posting a poem with no colored background. Um, and the hypothesis was basically that using a background color might affect the number of interactions that uh, we observe. Um, and in fact, there are a few other components to the experiment. We needed an outcome variable that we're measuring. In this case, the number of comments and likes that a discussion would have. And then, of course, I've mentioned the hypothesis. And then basically, over a period of um, 22 days, I used a spreadsheet and basically flipped a coin and uh, determined which of the two conditions my poem of the day would receive. It's basically an A-B test, like you would get from an A-B testing system if you're a news organization or inside of a company, but just something I was doing in a DIY way using a spreadsheet. And the idea was to, to make the most DIY A-B test that anyone who knows how to plug numbers into a spreadsheet could do. Um, and indeed, I found that in my, at least in my personal life and with my friends, using these color backgrounds on poems increased the rate of likes and comments by a factor of two, just within that 22-day period. Um, but then when I posted this, of course, uh, my friends had all sorts of questions. Uh, the biggest one was, why did this happen? Is this because people are responding to the color? Like it's bright and they're seeing it and it's like, oh, I'm going to read this. Or is it because Facebook's algorithm is promoting the color backgrounds more than they would promote the like black on white text? And so I did a second experiment. Uh, you probably can't tell that these poems are different from each other. And that's because on some days, I, I used the regular color background. And on other days, I took a screenshot and I posted an image of the color background. Because I wanted to see if the color background feature was maybe promoted differently than, say, an image version. And so I did the same procedure over another 30 days with my long-suffering friends who continued to get poems in their Facebook feed. Fortunately, I did two literature degrees, and I have a lot of friends who like poetry. Uh, so they went with it. I think I only lost one Facebook friend by the end of the experiment. Um, and, and I found, in fact, that um, the Facebook actually, at least collectively, even though from the user perception side, um, it's pretty identical, um, the images uh, received less engagement than the color background text. Uh, so that's another example where I, was, I did one experiment. It un revealed further tricky questions about exactly how Facebook works. And it was possible to do a follow-up experiment 
to look for what like a psychologist would say, like what is the mechanism behind this effect? And then finally, when doing this kind of experiment, you might ask, is it just me? Because as we know, these uh, social media environments are, are hyper-personalized. Each of us has different social contexts. We have different friends. And a uh, like behavioral effect that occurs in my social life might be different than a behavioral effect that occurs in your social life. And that's a real problem for behavioral product testing. Because if you buy 100 bicycle helmets, you expect under the rules of mass production that there's consistency in the product. And that it kind of, like if you smash it the same way uh, 100 times, it's going to kind of smash in the same way. Because we expect products to be consistent. And we know that companies work at consistency in their products. That's the opposite of social technologies, which are hyper-personalized. And the idea is that they aim for uh, diversity in how their product works, so that it's tailored for everyone. And so I might find an effect in my life. Uh, and it might be real and risky or important. But if it doesn't apply to everyone else, um, the way we think about it as society and the way we might expect uh, change from whom would be very different. If everyone uh, faces a particular risk from how Facebook handles misinformation, then we might expect Facebook to make changes. But if me and my friends are unique in some way, that we're particularly susceptible to misinformation, um, you might say that the burden is more on us than the company. So it's really important to find a way to ask this question about whether it's just me. And that's exactly what we did. Working with the students in my field experiments class, I organized uh, the students to uh, do similar experiments on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter using very different kinds of text than I was with my poems. So some cases, people shared like shower thoughts, um, you know, rap lyrics, poems, other kinds of things, um, and basically replicated that experiment. And here are the results. We did find that on average, when you pooled everyone's experiment results, uh, using color backgrounds still did increase engagement by a much lower factor. In fact, you'll see that some of the experiments, while it wasn't statistically significant, some of the experiments, they had a negative effect. So using color image backgrounds, uh, you know, may actually have uh, reduced the uh, attention people gave it. Um, but you'll also notice that we really only had one experiment on Twitter where there was like, we didn't observe any effect. Uh, these were not statistically significant on Instagram. And uh, so it's possible that you know, there's something different about Facebook or something different about Facebook's algorithms that mean that this effect is more, uh, more likely to occur or more common or stronger on Facebook. In fact, when we pool just the Facebook results, we see that the overall effect is greater. So that's an example of where you know, potentially multiple people doing experiments, testing a social product in their own lives, can then share the data from what they learned and start to build a common picture, not just of what's the nature of a problem, like people dropping bottles into uh, the water, but actually testing the effects of a product in their own lives and building a cumulative picture of uh, just what a product is doing in their lives or potentially uh, how to create change on some widespread challenge. Um, and I want to come back to Ostrom, right? These are a few uh, prototype efforts that I and now a growing team at Civil Servant have made to think about what it means to um, uh, monitor and also test social products in our behavioral, psychological, and media environments. And also make it really easy and cheap uh, to carry out this research, spread the knowledge, and verify these things as more and more people do replications in hopes that you know, we're kind of at this moment here with the internet where a lot of people feel like we need to put up some warning signs and say, you know, this part of the internet or the internet might not be as safe or healthy or good for us as we thought. And we want to get to a world where we understand and manage 
these complex challenges in an ongoing way so that we can enjoy the benefits of the internet for a flourishing society, we have a huge way to go. And I hope that these prototypes and explorations offer you some inspiration um, and start the conversation as we together think about just what it might mean to uh, understand these problems, uh, do independent work that holds society and companies accountable, uh, and work together for a fairer, safer, more understanding internet. Thanks, everyone. So uh, a big thing I'm interested in is sort of, we've talked a bit about in this in prior lectures, sort of an imbalance in terms of access to information between like companies like Google and Facebook that have all this user data and can you know target ads or do whatever like profit seeking yeah. things or whatever benefits them. Um, and this sort of seems like an, a response to that in that you're sort of moving the power of that knowledge to citizens and to consumers and to workers and stuff. Um, I'm curious, like, what you think it would look like to scale that, because obviously the power imbalance is still like enormously in favor of these like private corporations and in terms of like states and stuff that have already have access to this data. I guess what would it look like to like envision a way to move towards a more citizen-oriented data hierarchy? Yeah, that's, I love that question. So for the for the folks watching the video, there's this question about the power imbalance between corporations and the data they hold and the, their ability to intervene in like billions of people's lives and the power of citizen civil society uh, in respect to that. There's some really good research by Alex Rosenblatt and Luke Stark on this question where they talk about like information and data asymmetry in the case of Uber drivers versus Uber, which is a classic example. Uh, you know, I think you are absolutely right that these ideas are all about um, trying to find ways for citizens to use the data they have and scale the analysis, but also the power they have through that. And I think there are a few ways to do that. One is when people band together to share their data. Because the challenge is that this data is most valuable in aggregate. Uh, and so in the case of Reddit communities, when four million people and the, the like, uh, leadership that they have make a decision that they're going to collectively use their data to answer a question, um, that can be really powerful. And in fact, one uh, bit of research that kind of launched me in this direction was uh, research I was doing during a strike by moderators of Reddit against the company in 2015, where they actually shut down large parts of the site uh, to try to convince the company to give them more uh, tools for managing harassment and hate speech that occurred on the platform. And so while I'm not sure that strikes are always going to be possible, uh, when internet users work together, uh, just like these Redditors did, it's possible to bring companies to the negotiation table and change how they work. Uh, that's something we saw with the WAM study, where when we um, did this research, we made it public. Journalists wrote about it. That kind of typical journalistic accountability role ended up being very powerful. And we see the same thing with groups like Consumer Reports. Um, for years, the members of Consumer Reports have supported this research that publishes you know, the risks and problems and also the wins from different product producers. And there are companies out there where they value the, the reputation uh, and the views of Consumer Reports to the point that I'm told that some uh, executives in electronics companies actually have their bonuses pegged to how Consumer Reports rates the products they're working on. So I think there's a powerful opportunity for citizen scientists and journalists and others in the public interest and public sphere to use that um, uh, public voice to uh, hold companies accountable. And we see you know, uh, really exciting examples uh, coming out 
just now with um, uh, Julia Engwin and Jeff Larson's new initiative, for example. I'm really excited to see how peers like that are going to be uh, continuing to grow this work. Oh, that's great. Jeff is lovely. Uh, I have a two-part question. It's okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, first is kind of a follow-up to what Brian's point. Um, but, uh, I guess a lot of your work deals with kind of shifting the balance of power and reducing like, traditional gatekeeping organizations uh, in research. And um, for me, I think it kind of parallels kind of similar movement going on with the media, where like a lot of more like, citizen journalism uh, is reducing the gatekeeping factor that uh, like, traditional media organizations have. Um, and my question is, I guess, what what, like, what are you working on to kind of mitigate some of the risks of this? So the classic example is one that, um, on Reddit, they misidentified the Boston Marathon bomber. He like, got together and like, all pinned it on this other dude. Um, or like in more recent uh, memes, like the Ed Willen Twitter thread um, about a certain house that may or may not have been involved. Um, so I guess what, are it kind of, like, what do you think the role is of like, your work in kind of maintaining that level of accountability that traditional organizations would have? Uh, but also being able to kind of promote That's great. So there's a question about the kind of mistakes and misuses of power by, um, you know, at moments when you kind of open the gatekeepers and like invite a wider public to engage in information making. Um, I think there are a few ways to manage the risks. Uh, and there are two risks I think about. One is the risk of being wrong. And that does concern me a lot because it would be really terrible if we identify a risk that isn't there. Or we say, here's a solution that we think could help, and it makes things worse. Um, th that would be a disaster. Um, and so in that case, that's why you know, I work on creating r rigorous, reliable research methods, and also the uh, processes to make it easier for the public to do kinds of research that are reliable, open, accountable, and transparent. And so that's one kind of set of buffers against that risk. And of course, the other risk is from malicious actors. right? You create methods of research, and they're used by people who wish to do harm. And in that case, at least at this stage in my work and in the work of Civil Servant, you know, we carefully review who we work with. Um, we're not at the point where we're just broadly saying, hey, everyone, have these tools and have fun. Um, we're still refining uh, the approaches. And that gives us a little bit of influence over who we choose to work with. And then second, kind of follow up that. Um, so you mentioned a lot of it's like, you know, being very careful about your methods and specifying like, what you know and don't know, what you can include, can't include. Um, which I noticed in a lot of the studies you kind of mentioned in your presentation was like, you know, like or qualifying for like small sample sizes, or like you're not sure if it's an algorithmic effect or not. Um, I guess in a, we're, we're also in a current kind of point in time where I think media tends to take like re research results or scientific research and kind of like kind of cherry pick parts of it and kind of roll with it, and it's kind of less of an effect of like general less trust in both media and science, which is like probably unfortunate. So I guess what are you trying to do in presenting your results? to also kind of control for that. Yeah, so the question was about how you know, there are some journalists who just run with the parts of what a study says, and that can lead to a lot of misunderstanding. Um, I really enjoy uh, the writing of Maggie Coerth Baker on this issue. So she's a uh, writer for 538 and writes about these kind of meta questions about how science and journalists uh, re relate. She has a few really good articles on those questions. Um, you know, I think there are a couple of things that I do personally. One is that, you know, because our constituents are the public, in all cases, I write up a publicly um, readable version of the work, and that goes out to the people who are participants. Um, and that, you know, makes it possible for there to be a publicly comprehensible version of the work that anyone can read, which I think is one reason why with scientific papers sometimes the only account that is accessible to the public is the you know, really fast version that goes out on Eureka Alert or something like that. Uh, it can lead to misunderstanding. And then secondly, in some cases where it's very sensitive, um, I work directly with journalists to co-author an article. Um, but I think that's a huge challenge 
especially for researchers who are doing fast-paced, timely research on internet questions. There have been a few cases in the past year where some you know, move fast and break things researchers published preliminary results. It created massive public fear about something that maybe then the results were shown to be uh, more nuanced than people had originally uh, thought. And that's going to be a growing risk, especially as um, more civil society organizations do research about online behavior. Uh, here, or if you want to choose, Anne. Well, uh, I have a two-part question about the motivation. So the first is you talked about commons and trying to cast this in the analogy today. But I don't, I, I, I'd like you to clarify what commons you think are the important ones we need to protect. Like, I don't see the internet as the commons, because it's not like Facebook is depleting the internet or extracting the internet so much as saving people's attention. Or so if you could clarify what the commons are you think we need to protect, and then the follow-up to that is, given those commons, uh, to what extent do you genuinely believe citizen work specifically is necessary to protect it? Like in the case of rivers, I don't know, you can tell me how much, uh, say, the government, the EPA, was required to really do most of the cleanup there versus citizens actually contributed much of the data. And so, and I'll, you know, to what extent those examples were generalized to the modern day for the commons that you're describing. Love those questions. So two-part question about, like, what is the commons here? And also, do we actually need citizens to be involved in the management of these commons? So in terms of the commons, uh, I think you know, it's a partially useful analogy. We, we live in a time where you know, companies and investors talk about our collective behavioral and psychological resources as resources. They talk about mining data and behavior. They talk about data lakes. They talk about using our collective actions and thoughts and expressions as raw materials for creating products. And so insofar as that's actually a thing, and you know, that analogy has its limitations as well, um, it is, in fact, those like, behavioral and psychological resources uh, that are the resource that you know, are a common thing. Like our conversations, our relationships, are the fabric of society, the fabric of democracy. And uh, as much as we are individuals and we are in a very individualistic country, we're also part of a country that sees a common shared civic identity, um, or at least the, the commonness of the conversation and contestations that we have as an important shared thing. And so that's what I think about when I think about the commons in play, and we can have a much longer conversation about what that might mean. And then there's this great question. Can't we just have this managed by the technocrats? And this was, what, this was, the, this was the question that Ostrom uh, engaged with in the career that earned her the Nobel Prize. Because a lot of people thought of the environment as something that could be handled purely through industry and government efforts, through mostly what uh, Ostrom described as command and control approaches to managing common resources. And time and time and again, um, uh, while command and control sometimes works, what ends up happening is that when you don't have citizens as part of the process, and this, of course, is one reason why you know, people turn to democracy as a form of governance, uh, when you don't have citizens in the process, not only are there important rights that are ignored, but also there are problems and solutions uh, that are missed. And on top of that, uh, you sometimes have particularly low compliance with whatever your regulatory regime is. Because if a small number of people are making the rules for everyone, and not everyone has bought into how the common resource is going to be managed, then you might get more of that evasion that makes it harder to manage that resource. And so you know, in, a, in a lifetime of work, and, and in works like governing the commons, that summarized that research, uh, Ostrom showed again and again that while it doesn't always work, um, in many cases of successful governance of common resources, uh, you really kind of need citizen involvement in setting the agenda and also and in the monitoring uh, for governance to, to lead to successful management. 
I'm curious about the scale of time in here. So you were talking about the scale, uh, the scale in terms of um, the breadth of um, people involved. And then I'm also curious how time can also play in a factor of the validity of the data, as for example, just um, the, uh, the example of the, the image with the, the, the poems with the image background. Um, would that also be, for example, kind of sets out with the just like and white contrast? And as people are more used to this uh, form of display or this behavioral um, pattern, uh, how does that come into effect further along the way in the long term versus the short term? So there's a question about um, the validity of the studies, particularly um, over time. And one of the things that Ostrom pointed out that I didn't include on my slide is that um, monitoring is helpful in commons management when the situation changes slower <laughs> compared to when the situation changes faster. And I think one of the really big open questions for like research methodologists and like people who think about what kinds of knowledge research generates um, is you know, how do we deal with rapid, very rapidly changing environments online? So for example, uh, you know, if this effect that we observed with you know, social media color um, is driven by algorithm design, you know, companies are constantly tweaking their algorithms and what works today or the effects you see today might not apply tomorrow. Um, and it becomes really difficult then to say, how do we hold a company accountable for the effects of its products when the meaning of product is constantly changing and those effects are constantly changing? And I see that as one of the fundamental questions for anyone who wishes to like monitor and understand uh, and hold companies accountable for what they do in the world. And then of course, as you mentioned, there are also questions about how humans change and their reactions change. And that tends to be a much slower thing. And I'm more hopeful about, you know, I've, I've been spending the last year um, surrounded by psychologists at Princeton University, which has been a fascinating encounter for me. And there are at least some areas where researchers have found uh, like persistent uh, uh, theories that explain how people behave and respond to different kinds of stimuli. And while some things might only have short-term effects, and there are plenty of cases in the media where that's true, um, I feel like human behavior and psychology changes much more slowly than these products, especially when you have some kind of machine learning system dynamically changing the product in real time as it observes how people behave. And I, I think if any of you have ideas for how to understand and monitor things in those situations, and that would be a massively valuable contribution to society. The social data initiative. Yeah, so, uh, set up by social scientists in the last six months or so um, to get data directly from Facebook that they can then incorporate into their own research. What do you think? What do you think its value is compared to a purely citizen-based data collection? Yeah. So, I should. I can share a few things publicly about the initiative. I'm not part of it. Um, my, I think it's a step in the right direction. That like it is good that Facebook has committed to opening up a little bit. Um, I think that I would like to reserve judgment until I see their first set of studies because there are all sorts of questions about who's setting the agenda, what kind of research will be allowed, um, how they'll handle all of our privacy, um, and whether it really is going to be something designed to contribute to scientific knowledge and the social scientists. How much is it actually going to be focused in, on like protecting society? Those things sometimes go hand in hand. Sometimes it's a struggle to hold them together. And, uh, I think we'll have to see uh, at the same time, um, you know, they've done a lot of work to try to 
give independent academics and uh, other people some kind of oversight over the process, but also the company has a lot of power over what research they allow to be done, and particularly what the themes of the research are. And so I think that we absolutely can't rely only on that, because there will always be risks and concerns that are outside of what companies are asking or find comfortable to ask, and outside what academic researchers who want to stay in relationships with companies are willing to ask. And I think that much larger space of questions is where there's absolutely an important role for fully independent journalists and citizen scientists to keep asking the tough questions, the questions that companies might feel uncomfortable about. Um, uh, and there's a lot of scope for being creative uh, and asking those questions without the uh, you know, strings that come with internal access, however minimal the social data initiative is able to make them. So can you explain your question a little bit more? I guess uh, I know this uh, Yelp, for example, and it's very manipul manipulatable. And uh, there's no due diligence for you. There's not much of a due diligence on what, goes, what comes from the citizens. So in, in advocating for <coughs> citizen source information for scientists, how do you just think about the reliability of what you're getting? And, is it part of the model that there is some due diligence on what comes in? Yeah, thanks for, thanks for asking the question. There's a question about the reliability and validity of, of citizen behavioral science, especially given the range of what people might say and say the ratings on Yelp. I think there's a key distinction between uh, behavioral research and uh, methods that just ask people for their opinions. So with the studies that I've shared, what people are donating are not their views about something that they've seen. They're donating kind of their experiences. They're saying, here is the evidence of what I encountered in the world. We're pooling that knowledge in some way, in some cases, carrying out a joint intervention. It, with the study with Reddit, the procedure was actually carried out through a software system that people invited into their context. And so in, in many of the studies, um, we don't ask people to provide ratings uh, because it's not needed. The outcomes we're interested in are more behavioral. Does a person do this uh, action uh, rather than where does someone rate this on a scale of like one star to five? Uh, but there are some cases where, especially in some upcoming research, uh, we are going to be asking people from the community to rate things. And in those cases, right, we're doing, you know, using typical measures where we're uh, training people, we're uh, evaluating the reliability of their ratings, and, um, you know, hoping that because the community has a vested interest in the quality of the research, uh, that their ratings will be um, reliable. But we'll see how that turns out. That's a a next frontier for a civil servant. But I think for the, for the most part, we tend to be interested in behavioral outcomes, uh, which we measure and rate uh, according to a, pre a process and procedure that we agree with our participants. Um, I'm curious about, um, to hear a little bit more about how the relationship is between like your projects, the citizen science projects, and like gatekeeping institutions, especially ones that are related to scientific research. So is the goal more to bring the citizen science up to the level of academic credibility and scientific credibility, or to dismantle the power structure of the ivory tower and being the gatekeeper to credible science? Yeah, so the question is about like where I see my work in civil servants in relation to uh, science. Like, are we the vandals at the gates trying to like radically burst open the doors and let everyone in? Or is the idea to like, help citizens do great scientific research? 
Uh, so typically in citizen science, there's this challenge that the, the wider you scale um, the work, the like more variability there is in the quality, right? The more you ask like non-experts to do, the lower the quality of the work. You know, you see this in air testing, water testing, a bunch of other things, particularly where there is a manual process that something somebody has to do, and they may or may not be carrying out it out in a very careful way. Um, I don't yet know if that trade-off is going to apply to this kind of work, especially because in many cases, um, what ends up happening is that we write software that carries out the procedure, and then people invite that bot or, or other system into their social environment uh, to carry out the procedure. So it's possible, given that our software carries out the research procedures with people's consent and does the statistics itself, that there might be fewer points of failure. But we might discover over time that uh, you know, we face some of the same trade-offs as other kinds of citizen science. For now, the aspiration at least is for every study we do to be submitted for academic publication. Um, in time, because you know, the previous question that was asked about the reliability of the research and the high stakes, we may find ourselves having to develop new models of peer review to, to like work at the level of this kind of citizen science and make sure it's high quality. Um, but for now, we're you know, working through typical academic uh, structures. Great question. OK, unfortunately, we are out of time. So I want to thank you.